With Thanksgiving around the corner and retailers encouraging us to jumpstart our holiday purchases before Advent has even begun, songs such as this one are already filling public spaces, attempting to put us in the mood for Christmas. Each year may bring new cover versions of Christmas songs, often by pop artists struggling to keep their careers afloat, but the tunes are all familiar and cherished by us all. The image of a bearded Santa Claus in his red outfit and black boots sneakily delivering presents underneath Christmas trees will be in the background of our day-to-day -day lives over the course of the next few weeks. But who is this old man and why do we have this tradition? This morning we will answer these questions. As it turns out, much of what our culture today remembers about St. Nicholas has little to do with the actual life of this 4th century Christian, nor with the rich tradition of devotion to this saint that characterizes much of the history of the church. St. Nicholas of Myra, also known as St. Nicholas of Bari, or St. Nicholas the Wonder Worker or Miracle Worker, lived approximately between the years 270 and 343. He is considered the patron of children, sailors, merchants, prostitutes, the imprisoned, as well as several cities and harbors around the world. Uh, notice the patronage of sailors, but we can hope that maybe he's not paying too much attention to the game today. <laughs> as with any figure who lived 1,700 years ago, whether saint, political leader, or other historical figure, it is difficult to parse the events of that individual's life on earth from legends and traditions that have been told in the course of centuries and which may or may not reflect historical events. This is especially the case with St. Nicholas. The earliest texts of his life already seem to conflate different traditions, including stories about a different St. Nicholas, known as St. Nicholas of Zion, who lived in the same region two centuries after our St. Nicholas. Nevertheless, we should resist throwing up our hands at the challenge of sketching a life of the fourth century St. Nicholas. The stories that circulated about him in the early Middle Ages provide some key elements of his life story that are historically reliable, since they match archeological evidence and other textual sources. Furthermore, even when we cannot be certain about a particular event's veracity, the stories that circulated about St. Nicholas still provide a colorful image of what his life meant to Christians at the time, why local churches lifted him up as a model of faith, and how his cult spread to become one of the most popular across Christendom. The oldest extant text that recounts the life of St. Nicholas was composed in the early 9th century by a Byzantine monk scribe known as Michael the Archimandrite. In my talk this morning, unless otherwise stated, when I cite directly from the life of St. Nicholas, it's from this oldest version, this 9th century text. While this life of Nicholas dates 500 years after the time of this saint, many of the stories about Nicholas already circulated for a long time, even though we have lost those older versions. And it's good to point out that the 9th century version, our oldest text, already proclaims, quote, there is no believer throughout the world who has not found him a help in danger and a keen ally amid various troubles, end quote. Evidently, by the 9th century, the fame of St. Nicholas of Myra was presumed. According to this life, Nicholas was born in Patara, a thriving Greek-speaking maritime city of the Roman Mediterranean world, located along the southwestern coast of modern-day Turkey. So that marks the town that he was born in. The city of Myra, where he became bishop, is just the next town over um, to the east. So that marks where his life uh, was passed. He was born, according to his life, 
to pious Christian parents who gave him a Greek name that predates Christianity, Nicholas, meaning literally victory of the people. Scholars note that the name Nicholas, while predating our fourth century saint, was quite rare and only became common in the period following St. Nicholas, due mainly to this saint's popularity. We read that Nicholas was the firstborn and only child to his parents, whose original names have been lost to history, although some later stories uh, make up names to sort of fill in that gap. Nicholas spent his youth cultivating sanctity through adopting positive behavior on the one hand, he imitated his parents' virtue, attended the early Christian liturgical gatherings in his hometown with regularity, which we should remember this is in the late 200s when Christianity was still illegal. Um, so attended uh, Christian gatherings, um, learning about uh, the gospel message, uh, of course, incurring risk to his own life in the process, and uh, enlightening his mind daily in the teachings of the church. On the other hand, Nicholas also cultivated sanctity through avoiding participation in activities of the worldly affairs present in his town. He, quote, avoided political involvement and the corruption of the business world and turned his attention from common amusements like the theater, instead choosing to elevate his mind to the pure and truest devotion. When his parents died, they left their only begotten son a handsome fortune including property and many possessions. Nicholas was faced with a dilemma over what to do with his wealth. And like other dilemmas in his life, Nicholas brought his concern to ardent prayer and was inspired to share his wealth with those in need to store up treasure in heaven through charity on earth. Nicholas apparently did not have to wait long before the first opportunity to share his wealth would present itself. His next door neighbor was struck with economic trouble and reduced to destitute poverty. This neighbor also had the financial challenge of supporting three young adult daughters. Since his daughters were all beautiful and of marriageable age, which at the time we can imagine would have been you know, teenagers, um, he tried to find a man in the city who would marry each one of them. But even the lower classes refused to do so without a proper dowry, which their father could not afford. Giving into despair, Nicholas's neighbor plotted to place his daughters into prostitution at a brothel as a means of obtaining money to support the family. Nicholas stepped in to save the young girls from this misfortune. Being careful not to trumpet his own charity, Nicholas threw a bag of coins into the man's house at night, a scene captured throughout the history of Christian art exemplified here in this 15th century example. Um, this is a relatively small panel painting that's at the Vatican Museum. It's only about this big. Um, it's one of multiple panel paintings painted by Fra Angelico or Beato Angelico, who was also a saint. He was a Dominican uh, in, the fifth, in the 15th century, in the 1400s, uh, living mainly in Florence. And uh, one of the panels he painted was from the life of St. Nicholas. Uh, and you can see here on the left, it's the birth of Nicholas. In the middle, here is Nicholas listening to the preaching of the bishop in his town. Of course, the town is stylized as an idealized um, you know, Italian Renaissance city, but you know, the scenes, of course, are taken from his life. And then the scene that concerns us here is on the far right, which is this is the man who's been reduced to poverty. These are his three daughters sleeping. And here is Nicholas reaching through the window to drop a bag of coins. The father, moved to tears with gratitude to God, immediately used the money as a dowry for his first daughter. Upon seeing the great deed that occurred through his action, Nicholas rejoiced and decided to throw a second bag of money at night, which the father then applied to his second daughter and promptly married her off to a good family. When Nicholas returned to drop a third bag for the third daughter, the father was waiting and ran out of the house to discover the identity of the mysterious angel. Upon seeing his neighbor, Nicholas, he threw himself down at his feet, confessing to Nicholas his prior plot and thanking Christ for the mercy he had shown him through his instrument, Nicholas. Imitating Christ's mercy in the Gospels, 
Nicholas raised the man up from his knees and sent him away in peace, yet warned him to tell no one of his charitable deed. The story, one of the most popular in the life of St. Nicholas, already captures qualities that would come to define him, namely charity given in good cheer, humility, and concern for the destitute and especially the young. One of the aspects of St. Nicholas's life that historians all agree upon is that he was elected bishop of the metropolis of Myra, close by to his hometown in the early fourth century. According to one tradition, he was elected bishop of Myra after spending several years living as a monk in the Holy Land. In fact, the Notre Dame Jerusalem Global Gateway and the university's ecumenical center known as Tantur, located halfway between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, is just a stone's throw away from a late antique church dedicated to St. Nicholas and built atop the cave where it is said that he lived as a monk before returning to Asia Minor where he was made a bishop. Uh, here on the right is a picture of the gate entrance to Notre Dame's Jerusalem campus. This is the olive grove uh, on the Notre Dame campus, and you'll see that's the uh, Israeli wall. Right behind there is a Palestinian town called Beit Jala, and it's traditionally a Palestinian Christian town. And in the heart of that town is a church uh, dedicated to St. Nicholas. So it's just across the street from uh, the global gateway of Notre Dame. Um, Given that Notre Dame Jerusalem Gateway Campus has long been entrusted by the Vatican to cultivate ecumenical research and dialogue, it is fitting that it has a special, special connection with one of the most popular saints across Christian denominational lines, St. Nicholas. That Nicholas was elected Bishop of Myra is not only recorded in the earliest accounts of his life, the first records, uh, oldest records of the Council of, Ecumenical Council of Nicaea the first ecumenical council of 325, record him as a participant and list him as Bishop of Myra. Although the legend of him punching or slapping the heretic Arius at the council out of zeal for Christian doctrine represents an entertaining late medieval um, invention that has no basis in the early accounts of his life. The legendary account, though, of his frustration with Arius does capture his ardent conviction in Christian faith that is recounted in the oldest versions of his life. We read that he was a key player in shutting down pagan cult sites in the city of Myra. Um, he had an impact in the urban uh, you know, landscape of the city. Here you can see these are ruins that date from the time of Nicholas when he was bishop in the city of Myra. He apparently tore down pagan cult sites, including the main temple of the city, which was dedicated to Artemis. As the Vita reads, quote, he went to the most foul building and overthrow not only its upper parts to the ground, but also dug up the very foundations and rendered the demons who dwelled there exiles, which is what you can see here, the demons fleeing. Stories of Nicholas tearing down pagan temples uh, might not settle well for contemporary audiences used to learning about the benefits of religious tolerance. And we certainly shouldn't take Nicholas's actions today as a literal example of how to treat non-Christian religious buildings. But this story does still stand as a model for the conviction of faith that all Christians are called to. That is to say, the life of Nicholas challenges its readers of yesterday and today to stay true to their belief in the evangelic message vis-a-vis -vis beliefs and practices that contradict the Christian faith. And herein lies one of the characteristics of Nicholas's life. He is equally devoted to mercy as he is to Christian doctrine. This is an important lesson for us today. Today, we sometimes project an opposition between, on the one hand, a church that focuses on theological reflection and doctrinal teaching, to, on the other hand, a church that focuses on mercy. The life of St. Nicholas is telling us you can have it both ways. Along the lines of Nicholas's embodiment of Christ's mercy, we find many stories of him coming to rescue those in distress. He was apparently a man very concerned with corruption in the criminal justice system. In one instance, he stepped in to save three men about to be executed for a crime they didn't commit and exposed the bribery that lay behind the false condemnation. 
We read that he continually stepped in to protect individuals being mistreated by those in power and even appeared to judges in dreams, threatening them against unjust prosecution. One of the most famous early miracle stories about St. Nicholas is the case of a bilocation in which he saved sailors in trouble at sea. Fearful for their lives in the middle of a Mediterranean storm, some of the sailors decided to call out for Nicholas's help, having heard of his wondrous deeds. Nicholas appeared at once. Late medieval and early Renaissance artists sometimes depict Nicholas in ways that strike us today like a Marvel comic superhero. In contrast, what is charming about the story in its earliest iteration is that Nicholas does not fly in through the sky, nor does he calm the storm through a command with instantaneous results like Christ does in the Synoptic Gospels. When Christ calms the storm, nature obeys immediately, manifesting Christ's dominion over all creation. Instead, when Nicholas comes to the aid of the sailors caught in a storm, he joins in with them, helping them alongside, quote, enduring with them at every part of the boat, that is, with ropes and poles, he thus, with God's help, saved them from the danger, and after guarding them closely, restored them to a calm anchorage. The story thus underscores both Nicholas's ability to work miracles through his sanctity but also stresses that Nicholas was like you and me, thus rendering, reminding readers of their own capacity to cultivate sanctity like Nicholas. One miracle story of Nicholas had a particular role in cementing his patronage over children. It is quite the drama. There are many versions of the story, but the basic plot runs like this. Three youths knock on the door of an innkeeper, or alternatively, a butcher. He lets them in and he murders them, placing them in a tub of salt water to pickle them. Seven years later, Nicholas comes by the inn and notices that the innkeeper is serving food made from humans. He goes to the pickling tub, containing the children's remains still. He blesses the remains and raises the children from the dead. The butcher, after expressing ardent remorse, uh, is then pardoned by Nicholas. It might not surprise you to know that this story is missing from the earliest versions of Nicholas's life, <laughs> but it did have considerable currency in Northwestern Europe. Uh, you can see here late medieval illumination, and here is a, a statue circa 1500 from the south of the Netherlands. Some scholars have suggested it should be read as an allegory of baptism, in which the church represented by Bishop Nicholas, gives new life to children through the font of baptism. And you can see the visual similarity between the pickling font and, of course, a baptismal font, <laughs> with children coming out born anew, resurrected. Nicholas's miracles accompanied his body in death. According to the oldest texts of his life, Nicholas was renowned during his life for a blessed smell. The scent did not escape his body upon death, after being buried outside the city of Mira, the faithful went to pray there. Devotion to St. Nicholas grew quickly within Asia Minor, as evidenced by the construction of a church atop his tomb not long after his death. This church that you're looking at dates to the year 520, um, and it's a reconstruction of an older church. Archaeologists have found an older church underneath, which would have been constructed soon after Nicholas's death. Um, and the church, both the older church and the newer church from 520, they're built atop an ancient Roman burial ground. And from an archaeological perspective, whenever you find a fourth century church on top of a burial ground, that's typically because there was a Christian saint buried there. And once Christianity was legalized, Christian communities quickly built churches atop the tombs that they were already visiting at times of persecution. Um, so fourth century church, of course, so here, uh, built already in the time period of Christianity's legalization, would have been a small church that was demolished in the year 520 and reconstructed. Um, under the uh, Ottoman period, the church, like many Christian sites, fell into disrepair. And then in the 19th century, Tsar Nicholas, whose patron saint was Nicholas, uh, built a roof on top to protect some of the frescoes. Um, 
from the Middle Ages. From Mira, the reputation of Nicholas spread to Constantinople, which in the fourth century was the capital of the Roman Empire, and from there disseminated throughout the Mediterranean world. The oldest images of Nicholas date to the eighth century and show up in different areas, thus attesting to the speed of his cult. One of the oldest images is held at St. Catherine's Monastery on Sinai in Egypt. This eighth century image was likely executed in Palestine or Egypt, and it includes St. Nicholas in the bottom left-hand portion. So that right there is probably the oldest image in the world of Santa Claus. We find an image of St. Nicholas in Rome from roughly the same time period, just maybe a few years later, at the Church of Santa Maria Antiqua in the Roman Forum. Among the frescoes is an enthroned Christ surrounded by a row of saints, one of whom is St. Nicholas. This particular fresco dated to 760. The cult of Nicholas continued to develop in Rome in the 8th century, and by the end of that century, Pope Adrian built Nicholas his own church in that city, still standing to this day, the Church of St. Nicholas in Rome. When I was preparing this paper, I was struck by the evidence of devotion to St. Nicholas in the city of Rome. Um, and having lived there for many years, um, I was intrigued by where devotion was popping up within the city. And so for fun, I mapped out um, all the 8th century evidence for devotion to St. Nicholas in the city of Rome. You have um, this top star. There was a church that had a relic of St. Nicholas that's uh, described in a, an inscription from the 8th century. This is the church built by Pope Hadrian, also in the 8th century. Two frescoes of St. Nicholas in a church here. And right here, there was an entire chapel or altar dedicated to St. Nicholas. And this struck me because you'll see this triangle that's formed. That triangle essentially frames what in the early Middle Ages was the Greek community of Rome. So that tells us that devotion to St. Nicholas was probably entering the city through the Hellenic population. And then from there, became more of a broader devotion in the city of Rome. And of course, practices in Rome easily spread throughout Western Europe. So it kind of gives us an indication as to how devotion to St. Nicholas traveled. By the High Middle Ages, devotion to St. Nicholas is strongly attested throughout Western Europe. An example here being the beautiful uh, scenes of the life of Nicholas in the stained glass of the 12th century from Chartres. Due to devotion towards St. Nicholas across the Christian world, faithful desired to visit his tomb in Mira, and many Christians made pilgrimages there or incorporated visits to his tomb as part of bigger pilgrimages to the Holy Land. The 11th century, though, was not a good time for this, as war raged between the Byzantines and the Muslim Turks. Although the territory was eventually regained by the Byzantines, they temporarily lost much of Asia Minor. According to one account, in the year 1087, Venetian merchants who were at the time trading in Syria set their eyes on moving St. Nicholas's remains to Venice. As you can imagine, St. Nicholas, as patron of sailors, was very important to a growing maritime power like Venice. However, merchants from the city of Bari in southern Italy discovered the plot. Now, Bari was an important city at the time uh, and a competitor to Venice. You can see here on the map that Bari was a major departure point for travel to the Middle East, especially during the Crusader period. That's Bari right there. When merchants from Bari learned the Venetian plan to take St. Nicholas's remains, they decided to beat the Venetians to it. Different accounts characterize the translation of St. Nicholas's relics to Bari variously as either merchants stealing from the monks of the Church of St. Nicholas at Mira, or victoriously saving the relics from the advancing Turks. Either way, May 9th is marked on the liturgical calendar as the feast of the translation of the relics of St. Nicholas to Bari, a feast commemorated by Catholics and many Orthodox alike. Almost overnight, this is one of the places, this is believed to be the original tomb of St. Nicholas. You can see it opened right there. Some have attributed that opening to the uh, merchants of Bari. Bari turned into a pilgrimage destination and remains so to this day as devotees of St. Nicholas flock there to pray at his tomb. Today, the church is administered by the Dominican order. 
Due to the great love towards St. Nicholas in both the Christian East and West, the Dominicans regularly found themselves in contact with Orthodox Christians in Bari. And thus, in the aftermath of the Second Vatican Council, the Dominicans founded an institute for ecumenical patristic research in Bari near St. Nicholas's tomb. The institute is named in his honor, and St. Nicholas is increasingly referred to as the saint of Christian unity. I'm going to play for you a short video now that shows contemporary devotion to St. Nicholas in Bari. On his feast, the city erupts in celebration and carries images of Nicholas throughout the city with multiple processions by land and by sea. The celebrations include a solemn mass celebrated by the Archbishop of Bari, at the conclusion of which there is the official extraction of water from the tomb of St. Nicholas. For centuries, the tomb has been collecting water. Puddles collect amid the dust and bones of Nicholas. Some faithful associate it as a miraculous occurrence. Others claim it is condensation buildup. Either way, the liquid is at least a relic through its contact in the tomb. And of course, the water itself is mixed with particles of Nicholas's dust remains. Only about 50 milliliters of this water, known locally as manna, is removed from the tomb each year, only once per year on the Feast of St. Nicholas. And then it is mixed with holy water and distributed to pilgrims. So we'll see that at the conclusion of this short video. This is commemorating the translation of his relics. That box doesn't contain the bones, it's just meant to represent the moving of his relics. 1087. These are the Dominicans, of course, that administer his church. watching now is the extraction of the water from his tomb. At the end of the mass, the archbishop and all the Dominicans, along with other dignitaries, you'll see lots of um, Orthodox pilgrims as well, they all descend into the crypt for this annual extraction. This is the prior of the Dominicans. He devests and then he crawls under the altar where the opening to the tomb of Nicholas is located. They're singing a chant that recounts the various miracle events of Nicholas's life. And I've cut the video, but it takes about 15 minutes for the extraction process to complete. You'll see he'll go down. Fifteen minutes later, he'll come out. There's actually videos. Um, they've sent down small cameras into the tomb that you can see uh, what the water looks like in mixed with the bones and dust. You'll hear the people upstairs in the cathedral applauding, and then the applause travels down. The clergy join in. He gives the bottle to the archbishop, who venerates it, and then everyone in the crypt and all the faithful upstairs venerate it. Um, this is what you'll see happening. Long 
of St. Nicholas, the Dominican is saying. Devotion to St. Nicholas is strong around the world. St. Nicholas is one of the patron saints of Russia, where devotion to him is particularly strong, perhaps strongest. After their takeover in 1917, the Bolsheviks set about removing religion from public life, and this had a major effect on St. Nicholas. After the Bolsheviks attempted to cover up a 15th century image of Nicholas that guarded the entrance to the Kremlin, Patriarch Tikhon of Moscow famously summoned all faithful Muscovites to assemble before the image on St. Nicholas Day. Thousands turned out. The square was filled to capacity as faithful showed up to manifest their Christian faith in the face of oncoming persecution and to manifest their devotion to St. Nicholas. Soldiers of the Red Army looked on and fired shots in the air to intimidate the crowd, but that did not deter them. St. Nicholas Day of 1918 would go down in history as one of the last major manifestations of public religious resistance to the Bolsheviks. Just two months later, the previously deposed Tsar Nicholas, named in honor of St. Nicholas, would be killed along with his family, and the image of St. Nicholas that guarded the Kremlin for 500 years would be covered over. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, devotion to St. Nicholas has surged. While US media this past summer was focusing on Russia for other reasons, there was a major event that took place in the history of the cult of St. Nicholas there that escaped our attention. The Dominicans of Bari sent a left rib of Nicholas to Russia for one month so that the faithful could venerate it. It was a solemn occasion with thousands of people attending and lining up for as long as 10 hours to venerate his rib. So this is Bari, the Dominicans uh, transferred a relic of St. Nicholas. That's the Archbishop of Bari, together with the Russian Orthodox Archbishop. It was received with the whole military honor, with the bone uh, of Nicholas, and brought to the cathedral in Moscow and then the cathedral in St. Petersburg so the faithful can venerate this patron saint. to show you how long the lines were, uh, that people would line up, the news was having to give them reports of where to go so that they could pass by his bone. This was in Moscow, and you'll see here uh, the river with all the crowds lining up to venerate St. Nicholas. This was this summer, in June, this past summer. In the West, devotions to St. Nicholas uh, have led to many customs, especially built around Nicholas as patron of children. In medieval England, one particular custom was that on the Feast of St. Nicholas, the various boys' choirs of the cathedrals and churches would vote among themselves to elect a bishop for a day from among the boys. <laughs> this boy bishop would serve as bishop for the entire feast day of St. Nicholas. He was dressed in bishop's vestments and officiated at vespers, gave a homily, and said the benediction at meals. This was a tradition that combined veneration for St. Nicholas in good humor with the cultivation of a love for the office of bishop among children, and also the humbling of the actual bishop to remind him of his own call to be childlike in his own imitation of St. Nicholas and the Magnificat, which proclaims the exaltation of the lowly. The tradition was abolished by Henry VIII reinstated by the Catholic Queen Mary, and then reabolished again by the Protestant Elizabeth. Nevertheless, following the so-called Oxford movement within Anglicanism, there was a revival of this custom, and then the tradition was likewise revived among some English Catholics. 
And so I'm going to play you a short clip here that shows you an early 20th century version of the revival of the boy bishop at an Anglican church, followed by a Catholic boarding school um, where you'll see the boy bishop. And it's a really fun custom. We can talk more about it in the Q&A if you're interested. On December the 6th, which is the Feast of St. Nicholas, or as we know him better, Santa Claus, the boys choose one of themselves to be enthroned and take the place of the real bishop for the next 24 hours. His duties, including receiving offerings from the boys and masters and preaching a sermon. A medieval ceremony revived in a modern parish church of Surrey. So this is at the Catholic boarding school. And the mitre has two sides to it, two pointy sides. They represent the New Testament and the Old Testament. You see, it becomes a point of instruction also for children in the role of the bishop um, and the symbols of the episcopate. And the schoolmaster you know, kisses his hand, and they begin whispers, as you'll see right now. One common tradition in parts of both Eastern and Western Europe was to give children coins or sweets to celebrate St. Nicholas. This was because of his patronage over children and also because in many places, Advent fasting customs were mitigated for the Feast of St. Nicholas on December 8th, uh, December 6th in the midst of Advent. Uh, the tradition of giving coins to children on Nicholas Day was of course related to the story of Nicholas leaving coins for the young women. One late version of this story recounts that when Nicholas attempted to throw the money through the window, he discovered it closed, and so he had recourse to the chimney, where they landed inside, according to different versions, the stockings or the shoes of the family members, since they had placed their stockings and shoes near the fireplace to dry. Hence, children would look forward to waking up on the Feast of St. Nicholas to find a similar gift of coins or other treats inside their shoes or stockings. So how do we go from this hagiographical commemoration of Nicholas on his feast day, December 6th, to the tradition of Santa Claus coming on Christmas? This is a complicated history of fusing different customs. As some of the Protestant reformers attempted to move away from the cult of the saints, it was also difficult for them to abandon some of the cherished customs, like that of giving children sweets or coins on the Feast of St. Nicholas, or Sinterklaas, as he's known to the Dutch, from which we get Santa Claus in English. Martin Luther specifically discouraged the giving of gifts by St. Nicholas and instead encouraged the tradition of the Christ child bringing gifts on Christmas itself. Today, in some regions of Europe, you have St. Nicholas treats on the Feast of St. Nicholas. In other parts, you have Christ child gifts on Christmas. And in other places, you have both traditions coexisting. Both treats. Uh, what we have here in the United States uh, which is now, for better or worse, spreading around the world and wiping out some centuries-old St. Nicholas traditions, is really neither tradition, but a watered-down St. Nicholas who no longer comes on his feast day, but instead lives with magical reindeer on the North Pole, and seems to have thrown off his life of abstinence and gotten himself a wife, <laughs> Mrs. Claus. He also seems to suffer from gluttony and the lack of self-control in front of <laughs> chocolate chip cookies. Needless to say, these are all 20th century fairy tales that have nothing to do with traditional devotions to St. Nicholas. In many cases, they outright contradict the very reason why Nicholas is famous in the first place. In fact, 
many of the stories we take for granted today were first popularized in a book written by the creator of The Wizard of Oz. We began our time together this morning with jolly old St. Nicholas. I would like to conclude in contrast with two other traditional songs about St. Nicholas that are much older from other parts of the world where devotion is particularly strong to him. I think these songs touch a little bit closer to what his life has meant to Christian believers in history. Uh, so two excerpts uh, that we'll conclude with. The first is a traditional hymn from Bari, sung in Southern Italian Bari dialect. It merges the stories of St. Nicholas going out to help people with the local customs of commemorating him through multiple processions that we have just seen. The second hymn is the Russian liturgical hymn to St. Nicholas, which I think in about 30 seconds uh, summarizes all the theology uh, behind devotion to St. Nicholas. <laughs> Thank you. 